Pretty much ever since I started this podcast, I've been telling you about a service called Anchor. And if you hadn't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. And who doesn't have a podcast these days? Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will then distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you truly need to make a podcast in one place. Here's what you need to do. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Hey there, it's Chris Green, host of the 99% Local Podcast. This podcast exists because I love meeting new, interesting people and sharing stories of success and sometimes failures. The 99% Local Podcast brings stories from Middle Tennessee and Nashville-based entrepreneurs, business owners, organizations, side hustlers, musicians, authors, and anyone else that might be interesting and has a story to tell. Everybody has a story, their own unique upbringings, and passions for why they're doing what they're doing. As far as the name of the podcast goes, well, I think you'll be able to figure that out on your own. Hello, hello, podcast family. Here we are at another week, episode number 25 to be exact, and I'm especially excited about this week's guest because the topic is very relevant to our own and our family's relationships with screens. This week's guest is Doug Smith. Doug is a software developer, popular speaker, teacher, mentor, and author of the book, Unintentional, How Screens Secretly Shape Your Desires and How You Can Break Free. As a software developer, Doug spent many years serving Fortune 500 companies, startups, universities, and government agencies. From 2008 to 2016, Doug served as a senior developer on Dave Ramsey's digital development team, where he played a role in building out Dave's technology infrastructure. Doug is gratefully married to fellow author Lynetta, and the couple is blessed with four wonderful daughters. In his book, Doug offers an insider's perspective on the impact of technology, informed by his over two decades of web programming experience and a lifetime of Bible study. Unintentional shows how our obsession with screens often takes us unintentionally to places we regret. It reveals the way that many apps, games, and videos are designed to entice us to make decisions and form harmful habits that profit the creators at our expense. Doug's heart and passion is to help people recognize undiagnosed technology and screen addiction in their own lives and to provide principles and practical insights for overcoming the disease. Doug has been featured on both the Christian Television Network and Moody Radio. Doug's book has also received some nice recognition recently by winning a silver medal in the 2020 Illumination Book Awards for the Self-Help Recovery category, as well as the Notable Book Award at the Southern Christian Writers Conference Book Expo in the Self-Published Nonfiction category. I truly believe the content in Doug's book and what is to follow here in our conversation is crucial for all of us, especially those of us with children. Before we get into the episode, it's time for a giveaway. Doug was so gracious to give me a copy of his book to give away to a listener. If you were listening to this episode late and weeks after it originally came out, sorry, you're out of luck. If not, pay attention to the podcast Instagram page shortly after this episode releases for details on how to win a copy of Doug's book. With that said, let's get to it. Here's my conversation with Doug Smith. So I have Doug Smith here. He's the author of the book, Unintentional, How Screens secretly shape your desires and how you can break free. And basically, you're sharing what you've learned through your years as a dad, software developer, and a lifelong Bible student, knowing we're all being impacted and controlled by screens today. Um, this book, I think it came out a little over a year ago? Yeah, it was it was officially published in November of 2018. Okay. Wow. So, so, and it's available on uh, Amazon. It right is now, right. It is. It's available as an ebook and as a paperback on on Amazon. Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna tout you a little more here. Um, 
You've spoken across the country. You've done several media interviews. You've been featured on Christian Television Network, uh, as well as Moody Radio, and notably on In the Market with Jana Partial. I was kind of uh, excited to see that, and I, I went and listened to that interview last night. My wife loves Jana Parcel's show, so that was cool to uh, for you to get that exposure. Oh, I, I am. I've been a longtime fan of Jana Partial, and so yeah, when I was able to to make that connection. I was so grateful and she was incredibly gracious and uh, it was fantastic. It was uh, quite a, quite a leap for, for me getting started as a, as an author in this space. Yeah. Quite a, quite a platform there. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So moving on here, you've spoken on several topics related to screens, um, screens and kids overcoming screen addiction and really living an intentional life. So um, a little bit more on your background and you can fill in some gaps here, but as a software developer, you've served uh, a few Fortune 500 companies, startups, universities, and several government agencies. Um, you were with uh, Dave Ramsey's company for several years as a senior developer, where you helped him build his technology infrastructure. You're also a proud husband and father of four girls. Yes. And Th- that fact I did not know, and we're definitely going to have to get to know each other more because I have three girls. Oh, wow. You're, so, you're blessed. Yeah. You're, you're outnumbered yeah. like I was. Yes. Yes. They are younger, though. All three of mine are under 10 years old. Oh, my goodness. How fun. And I, yeah. And I know yours are all older and yes. um, believe out of the house. And so. Yes, we're recent empty nesters, but we're close with all of them. We're, they're our favorite people. So we're, we're very blessed by our girls. Well, awesome. So I'm going to, I'm going to approach this interview a little bit differently than I usually do. Typically I'll start with, um, your background, you know, start with where you came from, how you grew up and how you ended up in the Nashville area. But I actually want to start just by talking about your book. Um, and then we'll go towards the end, we'll get back into your background and, and things like that. So, um, what, I guess, what was your ultimate purpose or your, your overall mission that drove you to want to write this book? Well, thank you, Chris. It's, first of all, it's just really great. I'm so honored to be on your podcast. You do such a great job and it's, uh, it's fantastic to be here. Um, I, I think as I, uh, as you mentioned, I've been a lifelong software developer. I've been a dad, of course, watching my girls grow up <clears throat> and a Bible student. And those things have always been a major part of my life. And, and like all of us, we've grown up with technology um, just becoming a greater and greater part of who we are as people and as a society. We, I don't know if you were around in the back in the days of modems, and um, I think you're probably a lot younger than that. Uh, but, I, but even just low-speed internet, and then certainly you know, around the introduction of the smartphone in 2007, many, many things changed. And I just started to notice the effect on everyone around me and, and including myself, as I talk about in the book, um, I had already been, I, I had my, my own issues with screens before they became that small that I had by the grace of God overcome many things and learned a lot, uh, as a, in growing as a Christian and, and in my, in my walk with Christ. Um, but I, but then as, as I, as I saw the introduction of the mobile devices and the effect it was having on everyone, I realized that um, things I had learned prepared me for to, to see what was happening and that most other people were unintentionally just accepting it. Oh, it's new. Oh, it's cool. It must be good. Let's, let's try this. Let's get it. And, and yet there was this, as you look across society, or as I looked across society, I could see a uniform addiction forming. And and so I just felt compelled. I, I had an experience actually back in 2014 that I was really compelled to, uh, in, in a time of prayer, just, just I, I just felt this burden that, that people were, in, just really many people were becoming enslaved by their devices and they didn't know why. And I knew there was more going on behind it uh, yeah. because of my experience as a web developer. I didn't, I didn't actually know until I really studied even more how far the rabbit trail went uh, compared to what I've learned now. But um, all that to say, I, I just saw the bird, had this burden and felt like I needed to share what I had learned. Yeah, well, awesome. And we're going to we're going to dig a little bit more into that. But um, I know it, I was looking through several testimonials that you actually had on your website. But, you know, what has been some of the feedback that, you know, that, you know, is close to your heart that you've gotten back from, you know, readers of your book or, you know, individuals who have read it and, 
you know, they've came to you and said, oh, this really helped me make a difference in my life? Oh, yeah, that's a great question, Chris. That's, that's, you know, I spent two and a half years writing this book. I actually, like you mentioned, I worked for Dave Ramsey for eight years. And then when I kind of, when I had that really deep burden in 2014, I took another year and a half to pray and decide, if I'm going to write this book, I'm going to have to do something different. So I actually had to, I became a freelance developer to pay the bills while I focused, you know, intentional, as you can imagine, intentional, about 20 hours a week working on the book and then another 30 or 40 hours working on development. So it was a pretty intense two and a half years. But um, so yeah, the the fruit of that are, is the people that come to me and say, my marriage is, is different. My marriage has changed. My, um, you've people have made different decisions with their kids and technology and and they thanked me for that people have the best are that people have told me you know my relationship with god is is better and just wow I, that i just i can't tell you how much that means and and even in you know in god's economy if i if that happened to one person it would have been worth a two and a half year investment yeah. but it's happened to many many people and um so i'm really really thankful for for the feedback i've gotten and the people who have become more aware of what was happening to them yeah. Me for one, um, I think so. So just from background, we go to church together. Um, and I think I told you the other day, I just finished reading the book. Um, one of the really, th- the, one of the things that really impacted me was, and I don't remember which chapter it was, but you talk about replacing harmful habits with helpful ones. Mm-hmm. And you talk about, I believe winning the night and winning the morning was part of that. And to me, that got me thinking, you know, right before bed, the last thing we do is we're playing on our phones. We have that bright screen. Mm-hmm. Um, first thing in the morning, we're grabbing our phone to see, okay, did we get any texts or messages overnight? It's right. You know, it's, it's very addicting. It is. And to, and designed to be so that's the, that's yeah. the thing that I want everyone to understand. It's yeah. um, why I called this, why the subtitle is how screens secretly shape your desires. Like we're not aware that our desires, that what we want to do is actually being very, very intentionally and, and like in, um, university classes, university departments dedicated to teaching the concepts and books written on how to do this, how to exploit people's behavioral psychology, just on and on and on so that we feel like, Hey, I just really want to check my thing. And it's like, uh, yeah. you want to, because it's, it's uh, thousands of things have happened to make that a desire. And so I felt the same way I mentioned, as you know, in the book, I mentioned in 2010, when I got my first smartphone. I felt when I felt that I felt really troubled by it because I knew there was more going. I was like, wait a minute, this isn't right. Why do I really, why do I have to do this? <laughs> and that, that started me in that, in, even on that journey of, of realizing, wow, I've got to, I've got to dig deeper into what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. So that actually leads into my next question. You know, it, it's, it's intentional of these big tech companies. They want to persuade our desires. They're doing it on purpose. They're, they're making us um, to want and want all the time. They want us to buy more, consume more. Um, you have a bunch of articles on your website about how it's affecting uh, the chemical in our brain. It's, it's the, the dopamine. Is right. That the mm-hmm. right chemical. Okay. Um, and I know, so I saw you speak um, at a men's conference for our church last year, I believe. Yeah. And I don't remember if this was in your book or you talked about it, but Netflix is one that sticks out to me. They, they are manipulating us to binge watch. So, and, you know, I realize this as, you know, I'm watching the shows I regularly watch. You just can't stop. When a show's over, the next one automatically comes on. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they want to keep you inside its service for, or their service for as long as possible. Yes. And it's, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. It's, it's like an addiction, like drugs or alcohol. It is, Chris. It's actually, and it is a true addiction. It's like, it's like, <clears throat> because there's no substance involved, there have been, you know, over the years has been debates about what, be, if behavior, behaviors can be actually addictions, but we, we're learning in the study of neuroscience, especially these days, there, there's studies and studies and studies that are showing that what we do on our screens is truly invoking that dopamine cycle, that neurotransmitter um, that is so involved in our pleasure, our feelings of pleasure. The same thing is the same thing that happens with um, heroin addiction. I quote a book called um, Irresistible by Adam Alter in my book. And he, he goes way deep down that, how he, they've done studies about the difference. 
studying brains of people that do heroin, or his example was World of Warcraft at, at the time when his book was written. And the, ex the brain scans are the same, the behaviors are the same, the addictions are the same. So it's, it's, uh, it's very much the same mechanism. And so, yeah, Netflix, um, as I, again, I mentioned in my book, the CEO of Netflix claims that his, famously claimed that his biggest competitor was sleep. Uh, because, you know, he's, he's looking to capture our attentions on the margins and he absolutely is winning that, uh, in the yeah. lives of most people. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the shows, the scripts are written with a hook at the end to cause you to want to watch the next one. The app is of course designed to autoplay. And, and if it's done, if one season's done, it'll suggest the next thing or the next something, cause it knows everything you've ever watched. It knows everything you like and knows what you should like next. And so, yeah, everything we're doing on Netflix is because we're being programmed by Netflix to do that. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, even Amazon, I, I feel like they do that as well, you know? Um, and I don't feel like I'm making this up, but, you know, I could be talking about a car or a product with my wife, and the next time I get on my phone, an ad for that pops up. Right. People say that all the time. Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, so there's got to be obvious connection there to... Um, you know, those companies being able to either listen or, or, you know. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, the, the listening, uh, is definitely a thing. If, if you're in theory, if you're, uh, I mean, many apps, when you install them on your phone, they, they ask for like microphone permissions by default and you can turn those off. Um, but still even people just don't realize the amount of data that is gathered, even as your normal app or browsing usage. And the beacons that are that are tracking from you know Facebook and Amazon and Google, um, watching your every every move, remembering everything you ever ever do, and knowing what people like you want typically, or knowing what they what's worked for them before, um, and so they're they're constantly doing that so that they show you the right ad at the right time, they show you the right content yep. at the right time to keep you there. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so this next question is kind of twofold and you talk a little bit about this in your book, but so, and it may be kind of an open-ended question, but what are some practical ways or um, ways to recognize that we may actually have a problem or we're in trouble that we cannot pull ourselves away from these screens? That's a great question, Chris. Um, so I think the first thing, <clears throat> the, 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 the picture that I had in my mind as I was trying to reach, trying to tailor this message to, to help people, because it's one of those messages in general where people don't really want to hear it, right? We don't want to hear that we have a problem. It's like right. anything else. Like, ah, oh, it's I, like, like, you know, you, you might, you might be deeply in debt and you don't really want to hear about budgeting. You know, it's like, I, I'd rather not get a, a but I really kind of need to hear it. And it's the same kind of thing here. So it's my, my, my heart behind it was, or the idea I had was that um, a person gets to a point where they, they look at their life in a time when they're not, when they have just a few minutes and they think to themselves, gosh, I thought by now I'd be farther along in, um, in life. You know, I, things aren't going quite as well. I, I, I feel so busy all the time. I just feel, I, I can't, you know, I'm distracted and, and gosh, I wish I could get more done. You know, those kind of things. You kind of feel like, ah, I, thought I'd be farther along by now. And that's a really um, hard thing to, to sense. So I think that sensation of there, there must be more. Um, and then just asking the question, I, I just encourage people to ask the question, um, to, to just start taking a look and being aware and observing a little bit how much time they're spending. Uh, certainly, the, um, mobile devices have recently added screen time monitoring so you can look at that. It's easy to turn that off, but, um, but you can look at that, get an idea. The average person is spending, you know, four, six plus four to six to eight ish hours a day, depending on the study mm -hmm. on mobile devices. Uh, I quote a study in the book of 12 hour total media consumption, which includes all media, non-work related media, which happens to, you know, 12 hours a day that happens through multitasking because a lot of people watch TV and scroll Facebook at the same time, right. um, tweeting about what they're watching, whatever. So, um, yeah, so I think, I think just really take it, it takes that awareness, that opening, that, that, Hey, gosh, this really is costing me something. There's, there's something I'm missing. They talk about the fear of missing out. Right. And people are all yes. drawn to, I've got to get on Facebook cause I'm missing out. 
And I really want to help people understand that you should be way, way more afraid of what you're missing out on because of Facebook or because of Instagram or because of Netflix than you're missing out on by, by being on there. Right. So your yeah, life is yeah. passing by. Um, and so, so I think that's the, that's kind of the initial hook. I mean, if anybody's ever said to you, Hey, gosh, you, you know, could we, could we just talk if you're on your phone? Like if you're, if you're among the people that go to a restaurant and all of you are on your devices and nobody's saying anything, you know, that, that may be a clue. Uh, if you've ever had a car accident, I mean, there's gets on the, you know, gets on the, there's, there's definitely on the edges. And then certainly of course, um, there's, you know, we talk about, there's kind of the, mm, is socially acceptable addictions like you know social media and video games and so on but then there's always the deeper ones you know the pornography compulsive gambling compulsive online shopping all kinds of things that can be like even be darker than that and those are like extra level that's like addiction upon addiction there and so i would definitely challenge anyone who feels like struggling they're struggling in those areas to to know that there's there's a path to freedom and uh, they don't have to be stuck there yeah yeah great no that's awesome um so screen screens were not as big of a problem when obviously when you and I were younger and I'm a, I'm getting up there in age. I'm almost 40. So Okay. Okay. Well, you're <laughs> um, just getting started. Yeah, I'm just getting started, but you know, the the effects of this, you know, this this screen addiction is you know, I feel like it's it's having a bigger impact on youth today and maybe that's just because I'm around kids, but um I was going to say my kids were too young, but that's not true. And I was just mm-hmm. thinking about cell phones, but they have tablets. I mean, mm-hmm. my kid, my kids want to be on YouTube all the time and YouTube's mm-hmm. doing the same thing. It's, it's like sucking the life out of them and right. wants to pull them in. I mean, there has to be, you know, from this, there has to be mental and behavioral effects that, you know, there's scientific evidence for. So what have you found? Like, what is, what kind of, you know, behavioral effects is this causing in kids? Yeah. And that's, that's Chris, that's the most troubling um, part of it really. When you think about the, the effect on kids, it's um, the studies are showing and, and that because it has been, hasn't been a lot of time that, that kids have had like constant access to screens. So there's, there's not like decades of studies, but there's 10, 20 long, year long studies that are showing several different areas of effects of screens. And it's all, unfortunately, virtually all on the downside. Uh, we talked about the dopamine cycle. It is actually, so, so as kids, in terms of the neurological side, we, um, as we, as we grow as kids, we grow, uh, neural pathways in our brains. And when they're open to possibilities, they're open to, you know, and, and this, this, um, multiplying of synaptic, um, pathways grows and grows and grows until we reach about the age of 12. And then they start to kind of be, they call go through a process called synaptic pruning and the pruning happens in kind of a use it or lose it fashion. And so that's why we want kids to learn like piano lessons and languages when they're younger so that it gets wired in, it gets, gets locked in place. And so, um, so yeah, what happens with instead, you know, with screen time, they're getting wired into the things that the screens are teaching them. The, um, the lack of ability to concentrate, the lack of ability to focus on any one thing, the need to be constantly entertained or I'm bored and I don't know what to do, or, mm. you know, the, the inability to have a, a, a social eye, eye contact type of conversation type of interaction because they're not practicing those things. And so literally those things are being pruned away, um, you know, really causing significant handicaps as, as kids grow older. And especially as they, if they are, you know, allowed, a, a lot of kids, you know, are just allowed to spend as much time on a screen as they possibly, as they want to, which will end up being all the time. Because again, you're right. They're, they're designed that way. YouTube, um, YouTube kids is like a, a gateway drug. You know, it's, it's got all the same things. It's like people, like, people are like, well, just the videos on there are safe. Well, maybe, but they're, yeah, yeah. but they're, but the mechanism behind it, even if they were all safe, which I would question that, but um, even if they are all safe, it's, it's not the, it's not just the videos, it's the time the, um, and the things that it's doing to their brains. And so then when you take that back, then you look at, you can kind of, there are charts that, that visualize, um, you know, at this level of screen time, there's this risk of obesity. There's this risk of social issues. There's this risk of grade, you know, problems in school. There's this risk of, you know, on and on and on. And it's, it's virtually all on the downside. And a lot of this research is, is just um, 
still coming out. While we are on the topic of technology and screen addiction, I want to tell you about Circle. With Circle, you don't have to worry about hearing just five more minutes when it's time to turn off the TV or wonder if your kids are staying up past their bedtime scrolling through their devices. The biggest name in parental controls is Circle, and the Circle Home Plus is their most popular product. From mobile phones and tablets to smart TVs and video game consoles, Circle's parental control device and app lets you set limits and filter content across every device, all from one app. Block and protect, you decide what is and isn't allowed. Circle backs you up. Unseemly websites, check. Unfamiliar apps, check. Addictive video games, check. Circle also allows you to put time limits on the amount of time your kids can spend on individual sites and platforms like Instagram, YouTube, or TikTok. My favorite part of Circle is that at the click of a button, I can pause the internet for every family member or just one, tap pause when it's time to get going on homework, it's time for dinner, or someone hasn't cleaned their room. With Circle, you can also get a bird's eye view of all things internet, review your family's time online, site visits, app usage, even the current location of your kids. Today, I'm giving you $20 off the purchase of the Circle Home Plus, and that also includes a one-year subscription with access to all features, both basic and premium. I wish I got this kind of deal when I purchased the Circle device a few years ago. All you need to do is head to 99percentlocalpod.com slash circle to learn more about Circle Home Plus and to take advantage of this offer. Yeah, I want to I wanna touch on social media for a minute. You already talked about Facebook and the fear of missing out, but... Um, Facebook and Instagram are huge. I mean, I, I'm active on Facebook and Instagram. I had a side business. Um, and also for this podcast, I'm very active in trying to do marketing and, you know, getting publicity for this podcast. But, you know, even, even with personal Facebook and Instagram accounts too, it causes fatigue. Mm -hmm. Like literally I get, I get tired of looking through all that. And then, you know, same thing, the FOMO, the fear of missing out. Um, I think it causes a lot of you know, causes you to compare yourselves to other people's lives. That probably causes depression, mm -hmm. um, you know, craving more and more likes. I know for me, you know, trying to grow this podcast, you know, I, I try to get as many likes and follows as I can. And it, that's, that's an addiction. I mean, I mean, <laughs> whether it's healthy or unhealthy, it, it is. I right. Mean, yeah. So. No, I, I know. And, and that comes up all the time, actually, in, in interviews I've done in the past, because we're all in the same boat. We're all trying to share, get our message out there. I am too. Um, I, 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 in particular, have a really difficult time because I, so I don't do a whole lot on social media because I feel really conflicted about it. Yeah. And I'm yeah. speaking about it. So I do a little bit, very little. It's very, very boxed in. And I probably yeah. don't reach as many people because of you know, but I just, because I've gone so far down the rabbit holes and I know how it all works, it's like, I've got to be really careful. But I mean, it's, you were all in the same boat. Everybody's there, right? It's like, that's where, yep. if you're going to reach yep. people and they're all there, like, what else do you do? So it is a, it is a real dilemma today. I, I guess I, my recommendation is for those of us who are trying to get a message out is to be extremely intentional. And uh, there are ways of, of, of organizing our lives to where we really understand the, um, we get our really, really important things done very first and we kind of like relegate social media. I've seen people recommend just like a half an hour a day. If you could do just, and then, so if you only had a half an hour a day, what would you do? And so you, you would target that you would, and you might prepare, you might write content before then you might prepare, you know, posts you're going to make or graphics you were going to do or whatever. And then, okay, this is my half an hour. I'm going in. All right. Yep. It's almost like going into battle. So going in, okay, right. in and out half an hour. All right, good. And, and you can do pretty much everything you need as a media personality in, in yeah. certainly a half an hour a day. It, and again, time boxed it. And for me, like um, there's a really great author named Cal Newport who um, has written on one of his biggest books is Deep Work. And it talks about, you know, how, how you really need to focus, how, how basically multitasking is a myth. And um, so if you're, if you're doing anything that requires thought, which is <laughs> most of what we do, right? I mean, there are thoughtless tasks. We're doing the dishes. It doesn't really matter what you're doing, but if you're writing or if you're, you know, you're preparing a graphics or you're doing video production or whatever you're doing, you need, you need time. And so for me, like, especially when I was writing my book, I was like, there was no media before lunch, like zero. I didn't even look at my device before, before lunch so that I could wake up. Like you said, I win the morning I'd have my quiet time. I'd exercise. And then I, when I take the shower, these ideas would flow. And then I'm writing my book. I'll, all morning. And then I would check and then 
turns out the world didn't end if I didn't check my email first thing. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> it was fine. Yeah. So it, that that's kind of a thing like prioritizing that that what is really most important before whatever it is on the on the phone or on your devices or on your on your social media draws you in because like you said it's very much intentionally designed everything every aspect every color every story that shows up next every you know the like buttons the um the, the all the things that are that are wired in there um are designed to keep you from stopping and my hope was that my biggest hope for writing this book was well I have many hopes but one of the biggest hopes was to um help people just really understand that and almost have a sense of wait a minute I don't like I don't want to be manipulated I don't like being lied to I don't like yeah. being tricked into doing something that that's you know making I, I read that one of the recent things with Facebook in particular was they just recently were fined 500 million dollars for um I'm trying to remember what it is now it was just the other day but some they were fined 500 million dollars for some oh it's oh yeah it was for violating uh, the state, I believe the state of Illinois has a, uh, a ordinance on facial recognition and uh, Facebook was, was violating that by, because, you know, they tag every image in the, and yet they, they can show you on the picture. Oh, we think you're in this picture. Is this you tag yourself? Yeah. All that. So that's illegal in, um, I think it, again, I think it was Illinois or Indiana. Uh, anyway, um, so they were, <laughs> so the article says they were fined 500, $500 million on that, but it was like a rounding error to them because they're making, I think you know, they're making so many billions in profit from our data. That's all they do is sell our data. That's their yeah. entire business yeah. model yep. they're, that they can just, oh, well, you know, we'll, we'll keep capturing the images and write checks to, <laughs> to the states that whine and we'll just go and, you know, get some more. So it's, it's, that's what we're faced with is that with that kind of a, of an arsenal against us, uh, it's tough. It's really tough. We have to become seriously aware and, and again, righteously indignant about it. Yeah. I saw, I saw a post you had shared a while back, I think maybe late last year about the, you know, the big eight major social media apps having misleading and inaccurate ratings. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anything's really being done about that. Well, obviously Facebook was being sued for the facial recognition stuff, but so really, I mean, overall there seems like there's no accountability. And um, I think you hit on it. These large tech companies are, prioritizing profits over really protecting our kids. Absolutely. Yeah. Our so. kids and ourselves. Yeah. And all ourselves. Yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. All, all of us really, yeah. but certainly the kids, but yes, you're right. They, they intentionally make their ratings seem like, you know, we're okay for teens or, or whatever, or okay for kids. But, but what we're learning is it takes three clicks to get into pornography on almost any, you know, even on Snapchat, especially on Twitter, Instagram, you know, it's, it's there. It's looking for yeah. them. It's not just that it's predators. It's, and even if that was all good, it's still the intentional addiction and the comparison, like you said at the beginning. So, so yeah, it's, it's quite a thing. And, uh, and, and they spend record number, like I just read another article where they spent record number of, um, you know, of money on lobbying. So, uh, because as, as some congressmen are making noise about breaking up the big companies or regulating this, or regulating that, they're, uh, they have deep pockets to spend to help make sure that they buy the government that they, want. So that's a whole yeah. nother, that's a whole nother discussion. Yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about boundaries with kids. So a couple, you know, convictions that we have as a family is we've never allowed screens in bedrooms, whether uh, our kids don't have phones yet. They're Good. under 10, as mm -hmm. I mentioned, but yep. tablets too. We, we rarely let them have them in their bedrooms. Um, we've never had Actually, we've moved three times since I was married, and mm. we've only had one television in our house. Good for you. Um, and actually, prior to moving to Tennessee, we had it in the basement, so it wasn't something that was on all the time. And nice. we still, to this day, have one television. Um, but you know, what are what are I guess you know what are some other things? I mean, besides those things that you know families can do to set boundaries with their kids. Um, yeah. You know, so so good, Chris. I'm so, yeah. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, you know, in so many kids these days, even my nine-year-old daughter is like, when can I get a phone? When can I get a phone? Right. You no, know, I mean, I have no idea. You know, when does a kid need a phone? Because in some, in some instances, you know, if they're off with friends, you know, sometimes you think, yeah, it would be a good idea if they had one and you could stay in contact with them. But mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's a lot more, uh, stressful days than it was 
years it ago. So. It's tough to be a parent today. It really is. And the peer pressure yeah. to have a phone, to de doing what everybody else is doing, you know, because everybody, like I mentioned earlier, is just going along. It's, it's new, it's technology. Uh, it must be good. And, um, yeah, it's not, it's, um, I, I, uh, but you're doing, it's fantastic. The boundaries you've already set, Chris, well done. You're that's pretty countercultural to just have one TV. Uh, we did the same. Um, we even, you know, we're very weird and didn't really even have, didn't have cable or anything like that. We just did DVDs and movies. Yeah. Very, very intentional about what we brought in. And, um, and, and so, yeah. And no screens in the bedroom. There's never, there's nothing good that happens with a screen in the bedroom, no matter how old the child is, it's all downside. And so it's really yeah. great that you're doing that. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, other, other boundaries certainly are there. So, so one thing, one thing to keep in mind is um, one thing I mentioned in my book that other other speakers on this have talked about a lot is that the leaders of the tech companies do not let their kids use the technology that they create. Like Steve Jobs' kids did not have iPads. And um, hmm. so, in, and the guy that I mentioned um, in the Irresistible book, he, uh, he talks about um, they follow the cardinal rule of drug dealers, don't get high on your own supply. And, <laughs> and so, so thinking about it in those terms, it's like, wait a minute, what do they know? Like they're sending their kids, they send their kids to elite schools that have no screens in the schools. Meanwhile, we're, you know, <laughs> our local schools are like, let's get more screens in the schools. Every kid needs a screen. It's like, actually what we're finding is that's not good. It's not helping them. Um, it's, it's, it's hindering their ability to learn and to think straight. And um, so, yeah, it's all the rest. So, so in terms of coming back to your question, um, I think number one is be willing to be countercultural. And start a conversation with the kids. What I, what I encourage people in, in my talk, I do a talk on um, screens and kids, a countercultural way. And what I encourage people is they have to cast a vision, a context around which why we're saying no. And like your nine-year-old daughter, why can't I have a phone? Why can I, when can I have a phone? When can I have a phone? It's like that conversation right. has to start with, sweetheart, we're, we're here. Um, first of all, you know, I'm here for you. I, I love you. I want the best for you. And if, if a phone was the best thing for you, I would totally get it. But we're learning some things about phones and a lot of people don't know this yet, um, you know, and kind of talk about that. But the main thing is we're here for something more. We're here to, we're here for a mission in our family that's bigger than wasting all of our time being entertained. You know, we're here <laughs> yeah. to help, you know, there's people that need what we have to give. There's people that are, there's a whole suffering world out there that needs that, you know, what's not getting done, what's not being helped. I mean, there's, you know, there are all these things that we could get involved in that make it so much better or, you know, gosh, you're a really amazing artist. I want to see you, um, you know, doing, doing your art or you're an amazing musician or, you know, whatever it is that, that you develop there, develop them. So again, so that's kind of a, in, within the context of a family mission, then you start saying, okay, what, what role should entertainment screens have in our lives? And it should be very little. A lot of people do like no screens during the school week um, and maybe just a little bit of screen time on, on the weekend. Um, some people do like all school work has to be done before a screen. I know we homeschooled and, and, um, we could, we could definitely learn that like if a screen ever happened before school, their brain was gone and it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. So we just didn't, yeah. especially, you know, heart like math or whatever. It's just like, nope. So no screens until school's done. And so, but, but even beyond that, you know, what are we doing that's bigger? So the other thing that I, that I like to talk to people about is that, um, one of the things that screens do is they teach us to be consuming all the time. What do I want? What do I feel like? You know, it's all about me. And it, if we get into a mode of actually producing, of creating, you know, and, and developing our skills that way, and we want to draw that out with our kids too. So we want them to be, you know, are you building something? Are you drawing something? Are you, are you, you know, you're creating, are you an athlete? Are you, you know, just whatever it is, you're here for a purpose. You're, God made you here. They didn't, you know, he made you here for a reason. We want to help you do that. You're made for more than to be uh, providing data to the biggest corporations in the world for the rest of your life. You're, you're, you're more than that, even though, yeah, all your friends, I understand. But I, I tell parents in my talk that if you, if you are will, if you will go countercultural and delay, delay, delay um, screens for your kids, especially, um, you know, having their own devices or whatever, if you'll delay that, you're really giving them superpowers. You know, they're going to be the kids who have, who know who they are, who can, who can show up for work on time, who everybody wants, who everybody likes because they have social skills, you know, I mean, on and on and on. They're, they're, 
um, who, who are brilliant inventors. They're the geniuses that are doing this. You know, there's like, how do you do that? Well, I just, you know, if Mozart would have had a smartphone, I don't think we would have ever, you know, heard the magic flute or whatever. And it's just that, yeah. that kind of a thing. It's so, yeah, I, I definitely encourage people to be, be willing to be countercultural. We've, we've stood against as parents have fought peer pressure. We've said the old thing, like if all your friends were going to jump off a bridge, would you too? Mm. You know, all my friends have a phone. Yep, they do, but we're yep. different. And yep. this is why. And um, so, yeah, that's, there's a, there's an organization that I'm loosely connected with called Screen Strong. And their, their website is screenstrong.com. They're a nonprofit out of North Carolina. They have tons of articles. Their focus is more on kids and screens than mine yeah. is. Um, mine's, I've been more speaking to adults and families, and, but they're all about like, and they're all about delay, delay, delay. And here's the reasons and here's the science. And the, the, the woman who far, founded it is a nurse um, and has a lot of neuroscience friends <laughs> and they do some great, great stuff. So if you want to go deeper into whys and wherefores and what to do instead, uh, she wrote a book on um, how her, high school daughter graduated without a smartphone and all the benefits that that brought to her, uh, you know, so just even painting that in our imagination, mm. like really you could do yeah. that in 2020. You can survive. What? <laughs> yeah. She says she thrived and, and her daughter was <sighs> grateful. Her daughter saw the infect like kids, kids that I hear and families that, that I've talked with where they're not there. They've thanked me. They've thanked their parents that thank you for giving me an imagination, mom. I've heard people say that because they can see their friends don't they're just like what's next what's next what's next and so yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's a fight yeah. it's a battle but it's totally totally worth it yeah well great so your book is called unintentional how screens secretly shape your desires and how you can break free all right so let's take the next five to ten minutes let's go way back let's talk about where little doug smith grew up sure um, yeah. Well, I, I was um, I was born and raised in Portland, Oregon, um, before it became as weird as it is today. I like to tell people <laughs> <laughs> it's it's gotten pretty weird there. But um, my my cultural upbringing was much more kind of the Eastern Oregon farm farmer mentality. I come from many long generations of wheat farmers uh, based in Eastern Oregon, Eastern Oregon, and I worked on the farm as a teenager. So I was raised with hardworking values that way, and I. I I actually, you know, just stopped thinking about things as a kid. I remember as a teenager walking around wheat fields all by myself, hoeing weeds with no devices. There weren't any. Mm. And, uh, uh, or I didn't have one. I guess that there were Walkmans and things, but I, I didn't have one. So, um, but anyway, yeah. I was, um, so I was born and raised there. I, um, had really great parents. Um, they, um, one of the kind of defining things in my home was that my dad had multiple sclerosis. Um, he was diagnosed when I was three and, and it's a, you know, very degenerative disease. And so by the time I was like 14, he was, um, he, he was uh, legally blind. And um, so, so I consequently got to drive early and drive him around. And um, so there were benefits, but there was just a, you know, there was a real different perspective, I think, in our home as a result of that. And so and I have two younger sisters and uh, so I was the oldest. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time. Music has been kind of my my thing. My parents gave me piano lessons and I'm um, really grateful they made me practice. Mom made me practice through the hard teen years and I got pretty good at it so that now I've been able to play for church and things. And, and uh, I'm, I, I love, love, love it now. Um, but that was a big music was a huge, huge part of my um, growing up years as well. Yeah. So did you go to did you go to school or college out in in Portland? So I, um, I did, I, uh, went to, I actually went to college for electronics, okay. uh, electronics engineering. I wanted to, um, at that time I, I actually became a new Christian in my senior year of high school. I'm talking just maybe a little bit of spiritual journey there. I, I, yep. um, yep. I, through my, um, growing up years, um, my, my family was a great family, but they weren't very, I guess you wouldn't say very religious I, on that standpoint. Um, a lot of really good stuff, but not really, they, they had some bad experiences at churches and, and they, I think they had some real hard questions about my dad's disease and things. So they just didn't really, they weren't really into it. But I, so I decided by the time I was like 16, I was going to be an atheist. But then I, I got drawn in to a church and started, I was, I was a very nerdy guy. So I started studying things and learned and, and gave my life to Christ um, before my senior year. And 
became a, you know, just kind of a Bible student in every sense because I didn't want to fake anything. I just wanted to know the truth and learn and learn. And so I was a voracious learner. Um, but all that to say, I wanted to go to Bible school or, you know, become a music minister or something like that. My dad talked me out of it. And um, so I went to electronic school. So, so yeah, I did that. I actually ended up moving to Idaho, just technically midway, midway my school and finished in uh, Boise, Idaho. Um, but yeah, that was, that was that part of the journey. Yeah. So when, and what brought you to the Nashville area? So I, um, I had moved back to Oregon and lived actually on the Oregon coast doing uh, software development remotely for about a 10 year period. And um, I became aware of Dave Ramsey through listening to the radio program mm -hmm. there on the Oregon coast. And I had been, that's a whole nother conversation, but I'd been really, had made a lot of dumb mistakes with money. I had um, a lot of debt. I had, um, I tried and di tried to do different things, but I just didn't have a good plan about it. I knew I should be doing better. Anyway, Dave really revolutionized our life and we, we, um, did some really, we made some really positive changes because of his work. And then, so I heard him talking about, um, his need for web developers on the radio one day and we applied and, and, uh, yeah, moved out here in 2008 to go to work for Dave, not knowing anybody here except the, um, the people who had interviewed us. So yeah. it was almost like going out on the mission field for us to come out to Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah. I've known a lot of people actually on a, on a side tangent here that have kind of just took that leap of faith and went to work for Dave Ramsey. I've heard great things about the company. So yeah. Yeah. yeah awesome. So you've already talked about this, but so you were doing software development as a freelancer for a few years um, to pay the bills while you're writing and promoting this book. Um, I subscribe to your new newsletter. So this is public information, but um, you had said during a speaking event, and I don't know how long ago this was, um, but you met a VP from the company Covenant Eyes. Yes. And they are more one of the more, um, I don't know if they're the most well-known or one of the more well-known internet filtering and accountability software companies. Mm -hmm. And long story short, they offered you a job. And um, sounds like after some <laughs> careful consideration, you actually joined them as a full-time remote developer. I did, Chris, and I'm so grateful yep. I did. I really yep. feel like in a, it's been a wonderful thing. It was a, yeah, it was, I take a long time to make decisions <laughs> and in, in general, <laughs> I don't, I, it's in big decisions, you know, I really am pretty careful about those things. So I, and, and I had in writing the book, I have, you know, hopes and dreams about the book to be able to share it with as many people as possible. And I, and I really enjoyed my flexibility when I was freelancing, I was able to, you know, to completely set my own schedule and, if I have a speaking gig in, in, uh, Indiana, I just go and, and yeah. now I have PTO and, you know, I have to, have to tell people what I'm doing, but, but on the other side, I mentioned covenant eyes three times in my book. You probably, you probably saw that I've been recommending it to guys for years. Um, I actually, pornography was a thing for me throughout a lot of my life. And, um, by the grace of God, I found freedom in the, around the 2006 time frame and, um, through, through the practices that I, right in this book in terms of the, the freedom in Christ and practices that I share in the book and, and other things, but covenant eyes played a role in that as well. And then I've been a, I've been a mentor and a, and a help a, kind of an ally for other guys breaking free using covenant eyes over the years. And so, yeah, meeting, meeting this VP at, at a homeschool convention where I was speaking was, I feel like a, a God ordained appointment. And it was just fantastic to, to do that. And, and yeah, I've been with the company now two it'll be two months um, February 2nd here. So, um, <clears throat> so I'm just getting started, but I'm focusing on their Android um, platform. So there's kind of an irony that with my book that I've, that I'm an Android developer. <laughs> um, but I like to think that I'm doing, you know, I'm fighting the battle for everybody who has an Android device yeah. to make it as good of a product as possible to help people, you know, find freedom from one of the most difficult things to break free from in our culture, culture today. So yeah, I'm a very happy Covenant Eyes team member today. Yeah. Well, this has been great, Doug. Again, the name of the book is Unintentional, How Screens Secretly Shape Your Desires and How You Can Break Free. Your website is thatdougsmith.com. You're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at thatdougsmith, even though you said you're not very active. But what would be the best way for someone to get a hold of you or reach out to you? Oh, thank you, Chris. I think the best way would be at my website, thatdougsmith.com. And I have a, I have a contact form there 
that if you, you can write me anything and I, they go right to me and I will, I will get right back to you as quickly as possible. Awesome. And then just to finish up here, a couple of cool things I noticed you have on your website. You have an assessment called How Intentional Am I? And it lets you go through and find out um, how screens in your life are really affecting you um, and find out how intentional you are today. And I took that and I'm going to tell you I failed miserably. So, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I tell people, so. people say that there's no failing. You didn't fail. You, okay. you, took, you took the test and now you know you became aware yeah. and you know, you're, you're long, you're, we're all of, I mean, I had to write this book so that I stay on track. I mean, it's definitely, we're all in this battle together. So you yeah. learn, you're, you're now, you know, now you're, now you can become intentional and decide, you know, how you want to move forward. And so you definitely didn't fail. you you won by taking the test at all. So well done, Chris. Yeah. And at the beginning of this, uh, I mentioned you um, do a lot of speaking um, where you're going around sharing your years of research and experience. You're speaking at conferences, church meetings, community events, and um, I think if anyone wanted to was interested in having you come out, they could reach out to you through your website as well. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be great. All right. I, yeah, I love I love doing that. I have some I have some prepared things I can share or I can do custom things. Um, it's a big deal. It's a big issue and and we I'm happy to happy to help in any way that I can. Yeah, you also have a blog on your website which I actually spent the last couple of days ton of time going through some articles and research that you've published on there as well. All different kinds of topics related to screens and kids, um, screen addiction in general, and, and all kinds of other categories. So awesome. So um, just to close out here, what's next with you? Are you just focusing kind of now on your full-time job or are you um, looking to do more speaking, maybe another book or... Yeah, that's a great question, um, Chris. That I'm since I'm so new at my full time job, I definitely am learning to be learning to do the best Android development that I can be, uh, because it's it's hard. And I mean, it's what we're trying. To, I guess what I'm trying to say, what we're trying to do is hard. Like we're competing against all the big guys, you know, trying to not have us monitor and filter what you know what we need to do. So it's a challenge. Yeah. It's a battle. Yeah. So learning learning to do that well is big. But I'm definitely promoting my book. Still doing interviews and speaking um we're, uh, we're um have several have actually several things going on even just coming up in february and uh so looking for more of that um i have other book ideas but i um kind of waiting to see a little bit more response on this book before i mean this is at a great response but not quite at the level where i would put another two and a half years into another book where the market is saying doug write another book um, but I have I have another idea. I have other ideas if that if that becomes a thing. Uh, but I think it's still pretty new. It's even just it's been out a year, but it's still uh, it's my first book in this space as a you know coming out and on time and on this topic. So I have quite a lot of work to do in building the platform and reaching people with this book before I I start another one. So I'll probably just be more blogging and speaking and sharing this book as often as I can. That was my discussion with Doug Smith. If you want to learn more about Doug, his book, or even inquire about having him come speak at an upcoming event, you can do that on his website at thatdougsmith.com. While you're on the website, make sure you go take his How Intentional Am I assessment. It's a short 20-question assessment to help you find out how intentional you are today. Last but not least, go pick up Doug's book on Amazon, available in paperback and ebook. The book, again, is called Unintentional, How Screens Secretly Shape Your Desires and How You Can Break Free. Before we get out of here, thanks for listening. And as always, you can drop me a line at 99%localpod at gmail.com. Also, you can always find me on Instagram at 99%localpod. Until next week, take care.